All right. So we are going to pick up um, from last time, but there's also, aside from Obama announcing the uh, authorization for preemptive cyber strikes and drone attacks on U.S. soil, uh, there's a new APT uh, campaign that's been discovered um, called Operation Beavis, and that's uh, targeting um, basically aerospace and defense industries and defense contractors, and primarily aimed at uh, gaining access points in those companies, primarily to steal intellectual property and research and blueprints. Um, so that's interesting. So we're going to pick up from last time uh, because I feel I did a somewhat poor job of explaining uh, uh, some of the later parts of shellcode, especially uh, uh, privilege escalation in shellcode. So I want to bring up the man page for set RESUID. Um, the main thing to realize here is that when using this, you may change the real UID, the effective UID, and the saved set user ID to each of something from the following set. The current real UID, the current effective UID, and the current saved set user ID. So say those are all respectively five, six, seven. I would not be permitted to simply call set RESUID 000. zero, zero because none of those values exist in those current value set, and that's part of the permissions handling for um, per privilege modification in the uh, basically Unix world. So I felt that need, need to be go, gone over. Um, and so we're gonna jump from that into uh, SEH exploitation. The reason I wanna cover SEH exploitation so much is because it's a big part of Windows exploitation. Now, I haven't gone over how to write window shell code um, because it's a very difficult process. Um, writing shell code itself is already difficult enough to teach you guys. I don't want to lose everyone. Um, I'm not very good at writing window shell code as well, but there's tons of repositories out there for it. Um, and SEH exploitation is a, it's a technique that's, been on the rise in the past years. Uh, it's currently probably at least involved in 20% of the uh, uh, exploits provided by Metasploit framework. Um, so it's important to know about because it also affects the stack and stack overflow. Um, so basically it involves any applications that use try-catch statements to handle exceptions. Um, and we covered this a little bit last time at the end. Um, so there's two types of exceptions. There's C exceptions and C++ exceptions. Um, C exceptions are mainly just plain SEH exceptions, which are also known as Win32 or system exceptions. Um, and they're supported by the compiler with try, accept, finally. And there might be a few new ones that I'm not aware of. Um, C++ exceptions are implemented on top of the SEH uh, handling uh, framework. And they allow for throwing and catching of arbitrary types of events, those outside of the declared st standard system exceptions. Um, so Microsoft Visual C++ compiler implements this in a complex way that involves automatically unwinding the stack during exception processing. Um, so the exception dispatcher unwinds the stack and checks for certain things we'll cover later, like making sure that the pointers are all valid in this chain and making sure that the cookies haven't been overflowed. Um, but there's ways to bypass all of that, and we'll go into it in depth. So C++ layers, yeah. And so you've all seen it. It's that something has encountered a problem and needs to close error, uh, error window. So, <clears throat> this is a simplified view of the stack before we jump into all the details. Basically, you have the normal variables on the stack, your local variables, um, save EVP, save EIP, some parameters perhaps, and then at the start of the, uh, the exception handler values on the stack, 
Um, that section up till the top of the stack, roughly, is roughly for the try function. Um, and then roughly after here is uh, basically the handling of calling all the possible cache statements. And there's a default cache statement provided by Windows. And that is the, this has encountered a problem and needs to close. Would you like to send an error report so we can ignore it perhaps or close this? So on the left is a normal stack. It, on the right is basically you have a lot more added to a stack when you have SEH being handled in a function. Um, you have an exception pointer. You have SEH records. Those are basically pairs of uh, uh, four-byte records. They're all D-word pointers. Um, then you have other SEH handler variables and pointers. Basically, what you need to know is this is what SEH records look like. The pair of D word pointers are broken down into the first one is a pointer to the next SEH record. It forms a linked list in this way. And the second value is a pointer off to some sort of executable segment of memory where the actual exception handler code is stored, that patch statement. And so it chains on and on and on. And the, the last exception handler, um, when the address space is not randomized, is uh, X, F, 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 and so on. Um, and that kicks in Windows default exception handler. So I wanted to show um, the implementation details on the stack for SEH3 and SEH4 implementations. Um, I need to blow this up. There we go. So essentially, uh, this next SCH frame um, should have been expanded to uh, point to more and more records in the same chain. But essentially, this is pointing to the default one, since there's only one catch statement here. And uh, the Oh wait, I'm sorry, I followed the wrong line. So you see how the next SEH frame points to this linked list and so on. Um, this is usually also on the stack. Um, and the SEH handler, uh, part of this record pair, points to the executable segment. And each one of these SEH handlers will point to the executable segment for the corresponding exception handler code. Um, the scope table stuff, don't really need to concern yourself with it. Uh, for exploiting this stuff. Most exploits don't involve even looking that. Um, now, in later implementations of this, um, the compiler added some stack overflow prevention mechanisms, essentially canaries. And so what happens when uh, with canaries is that there's code uh, compiled into the binary by the compiler to generate random canaries, random cookies, basically. And then these cookies are put on the stack in important places to protect certain common targets, like the return value, or perhaps the SEH values, because those uh, became commonly exploited. So they decided to add cookies to those as well. And so what happens is, periodically at runtime, these things are checked, make sure the cookies are still intact. If the cookies are not intact and they've been overwritten with something like 414414 and all A's, basically it generates uh, essentially an exception and begins the shutdown process. Um, however, I believe, unless they've changed it, that also exists in user space. It should instead be handled as a kernel trap. And uh, there's a paper that suggests that um, quite cogently that I'll cite later on and show you guys. So details here can vary. Um, there's also other cookies, uh, like an EH cookie. Um, but SEH ex uh, exploits, for the most part, don't attack those, uh, as far as you need to be concerned. Um, so we saw the key checker had a 
I want to write. Amen. I believe so. Yeah. It um so the exception handlers are uh I think I have a slide. So by default, each uh, application, I'd rather say each process has an exception handler and has uh, SEH code in it. Um, usually it's located in some part of the main uh, function, um, but it by default gets put into every thread. So when an exception occurs, basically um, and it iterates the, the dispatch the exception dispatcher function, usually in the text segment, is invoked. It looks at the stack, looks at the first SEH record, and then basically iterates down the chain of SEH records until it's handled. And if it gets all the way to the end, to the default one, it invokes a standard error message. And so, uh, another thing that's interesting is that when that happens, uh, a DLL gets injected, uh, fault ref .dll, and that provides the functionality to send these error reports. I think there may have been some exploits in the past that involved trojanizing that in a sense, um, which is interesting. So essentially what happens when the exception dispatcher kicks in is that it has its own stack probably located on the same stack in that process. And um, it's looking at these values on the program stack. And so what happens is that this top value gets populated with the address to the executable code to handle the first, the top exception. And as it iterates down the pointer to the corresponding exception handler is populated in this value as well. And these four arguments are loaded onto the stack for when this exception handler is then called. Essentially, the exception dispatcher um, does some checking and then calls the value that's loaded on the stack here. So it causes the EIP to point there and then it begins executing the code there. So these records are basically provided to wherever that function jumps as the arguments to handle. Oops. So another thing that's worth noting, and the primary thing that's in, uh, targeted um, for exploitation is the pointer to the next SEH record. This um, gets populated here. So it's not actually, what gets stored here is not actually the value here, it's this address in memory. So that it basically the value here points there and the value there points wherever else to the next SEA tracker. And so that is the establisher frame. So since it is on the stack, it can be over, these values can be overflowed um, and they occur before the return value and so that's two ways you can hijack EIP, so it's double the fun, in a sense. Um, but that's assuming there's exception handling in that function, and there may not. So this is a snapshot from Ida Pro, and it re recognizes where the SEH record is, and this just happens to be one that's completely been overflowed by all A's. And so, very early on, the SEH designers knew about stack overflows and Frax articles about smash the stack for fun and profit were out for a good while by then. Um, so they implemented some protections against uh, stack overflows. And since Windows XP Service Pack 1, before the exception handler is called, all the registers were Zord uh, out to be zero. And I believe that's what the uh, that was handled by the exception dispatcher or whatever was calling that. So that can make exploit development a little difficult if you're relying on calling an address and passing uh, arguments to it as uh, arguments in the registers. For instance, when um, just 
doing straight uh, into Ox80 system calls, you pass the arguments in the registers. That disables that avenue of attack. Um, without, well, it actually makes it a bit more difficult. It's not truly impossible because you can jump to shellcode later on. So what happened? The next mutable security mechanism that was added later on in uh, Windows 2003 server were stack cookies, uh, GS cookies. So I've already briefly talked about this, and they're generated at runtime, and they're used to pad these targets on the stack, and that's used for detecting overflows. But these cookie values are stored in the dot data section. And the dot data section has write permissions. So theoretically, it is possible to overwrite whatever the random cookie is, and then say you just set it to 414141, and it would never detect a stack overflow of all A's. So another thing that was implemented in 2003 was a thing called safe SEH. It's a much more robust uh, exception handler Im implementation. And what occurs is that when the exception dispatcher kicks in, it checks the value here to make sure whatever this is pointing to is in its already registered list of handlers. So this registered list of handlers is constructed beforehand. And this is basically its way of checking to make sure that it hasn't been overflowed to point to somewhere else in memory, it's perhaps to point to environment variables where shellcode is or something like that. So essentially, if it does not match its list of registered handlers, it will not execute that exception handler. Also, usually if the address points to the stack, it will not execute as well. Um, actually, I take that back. I'm very certain if the address points back to the stack, it will not execute it as well. But there's some flaws to this. It will still execute if the address points to the heap. Um, and what's also most commonly exploited, if the address handler points to an address outside of the image, the process image, in other words, to a different module, say another DLL, or outside of rather the current image or the current DLL, these are called modules, then it is still executed. So if you have some common DLL that is used by this process or used by a group of applications that you want to exploit, you can point basically the exception handler to some code that favors your exploit or is vulnerable um, in that common DLL. And the exception handler will still execute it even with safe SEH uh, enabled. Even though it's not on the list of registered handlers. Exactly. Even though it's not in that list of registered handlers, it will still go to it and execute it. And so very early on, people in the community basically raised attention to this, say this actually allows for attackers to do certain things easier. Um, and so I don't know why Microsoft didn't uh, prevent this. Maybe it's some politics on the various application teams. Maybe they like having their exception handlers in DLLs and stuff like that. I don't know. So um, this paper that I link at the bottom is a wonderful uh, white paper on all of this. It explains in great detail on how to defeat uh, these, these overflow prevention mechanisms. Um, in, uh, Zoring out all the registers, stack cookies, and safe SEH. Um, and I, it explains the, the commonly used technique, uh, pop, pop, ret, which is basically the easiest technique to use because you're exploiting this last flaw that if you point it to somewhere outside the process image, it's fine. So to recap, if you redirect it back to the stack, some shellcode on stack, the exception dispatcher is not going to execute that. But if you redirect it to somewhere on the heap that you have shellcode, the exception dispatcher will execute that. Um, but that can be tricky. And the next section in this lecture is actually on heap exploitation. <coughs> so we'll get to that. But, and so if you also redirect it to some other module's code outside the process image, 
it will uh, it will uh, I'm sorry this exception dispatcher will execute that as well uh, also if you redirect it to something on the list of registered handlers it will execute that as well usually that's not advantageous to attackers but sometimes it can be so the three methods for bypassing the overflow mitigations for SEH uh, to hijack EIP are mainly comprised of first you overwrite the cookie in the dot data section to sabotage those uh, GS stack cookie checks. Then you overflow the local buffer in whatever function you're uh, attacking um, to overwrite the, the SEH record structure. Specifically, it's called exception registration structure. And you want to do one of three things. You want to set the pointer to an already registered handler and abuse that somehow. Or you want to uh, overwrite the pointer with an address that is outside the range of the loaded module. Or you want to point it to somewhere on the heap. Perhaps you also want to overflow uh, the return value on the stack as well, just for good measure to point to the shell code, um, just in case you can't trigger that exception. So. I'm going to cover method two because it's the most common approach. Um, so when the exception handler kicks in, this is basically the view of the exception handler stack. You have basically the value here points to that executable code to handle the exception. And the value here points back to the original process's stack. Um, so What is commonly done is that attackers find a advantageous set of instructors in some outside DLL to point to that manipulates the stack. Since we have a pointer that points back to the program stack, that's what we want to get back to because that's probably uh, that process memory space contains our shellcode. Um, and it's usually not the case that you can exploit some DLL uh, as well as this vernable program uh, by attacking the SEH and getting them to work together. That I don't think ever happens. So what happens is that attackers jump to some sequence that manipulates the stack and then calls uh, some assembly function to jump back to that address stored here in the establisher frame. So the most common way to do this is to look for a sequence of pop, pop, return instructions. So <clears throat> essentially, when executing an arbitrary pop pop return sequence, the following will happen to the stack. Pop register 32, it could be pop EAX32, something like that, will remove this first value off the stack and then move the stack pointer to point to uh, the ESP to point to exception record. The next pop will remove that value off the stack. It doesn't matter what these registers are. You can pop them into any registers and pop pop returns are not uncommon. And so then after popping this one off, it moves the stack pointer down to the top of the stack, uh, points to the establisher frame. And when return is called, it takes that value and basically calls it. So effectively, what happens is that EIP now points here. So now we can execute instructions on the stack. And however, I mean, this is good. This is progress. However, you can see that it doesn't point to our shell code, which is usually um, in SEH exploits appended to the end of the overwriting of the SEH record, those two D word pointers. So what exploit developers do next is essentially this next SEH record isn't checked by the exception dispatcher. Um, the only thing that's checked by the exception dispatcher is that SE handler. And we're already overwriting that to point to somewhere else in memory. So we could overwrite this with some sort of instructions. However, we only have four bytes here. So we can't fit any form of shell code into just four bytes. So what is common to do is to just fill this four bytes with some sort of jump instruction to wherever the shellcode is. And then that's usually only two bytes. 
So you have to take up the rest of the four bytes up with knobs. So it's going to be some jump instruction, and then knob, knob to equal the full four bytes. So in this particular example, I have the shell code after this. The shell code could be before or anywhere else in memory as long as they can accurately address it. So <clears throat> through this common approach to jump back to the original program stack and have EIP now pointing there, we can have the next SEH record overwritten at the end of our stack overflow with this jump six bytes forward and then knop knop sequence. And that will point to shellcode afterwards. Does anyone have any questions on this? Is anyone fuzzy on this? Feel free to raise your hand and stop me. So we don't, we don't mention that uh, the safe SEH the of the Safe SEH will not execute this SE handler if it points to the stack. Okay. But what we're doing is we're pointing it to an, uh, an address outside the uh, address space for the image and then exploiting a pop, pop return sequence to get EIP to point back to the stack. No, once, okay, so, let me let me let me explain the scope of the the exception dispatcher. So when the exception dispatcher kicks in, it checks this SE handler to make sure it's valid. Then it loads it onto a stack along with all those four arguments. Then it calls that value. The exception handler is done there. What happens is execution takes over in that uh, target code specifically what the attacker has chosen to be an address to a pop pop return sequence. So then that manipulates the stack that was provided to it, pops off those values, and then looks for that third value on the stack to have the return uh, call jump back to the original process stack. And that's where the attacker has more executable code. Yes? When you create the no ops, how did we write those into the record? So each no op takes off one byte. This short jump uh, instruction um, takes up two bytes. So this D word pointer space is a four byte space. Um, and when return is called, it jumps to the very beginning of it. Um, we could have it be any garbage instruction. Um, and theoretically, it would still work because it's still jumping to the beginning of that. And as long as the beginning of that is a jump to whatever wherever your shell code is, then the attack will work. Uh, how did we get to the point where uh, the, the handler that top is that? So, um, when an exception occurs at any stage, at any stage in the process um, execution, if an exception occurs, the exception handler, uh, the exception dispatcher, will kick in, um, interrupting whatever ex whatever the processor was doing at the moment. Um, those values all get saved in case the exception can be handled, and then uh, normal execution of the process can resume, um, such as like file not found exception or something like that. Uh, and but so what we're doing is part of this is we have to basically rewrite the stack cookie. Then we have to basically overwrite these SEH records, and then we uh, have our shell code. And to trigger it all, we have to cause an exception. Understand? These are, these are great questions. Thanks for asking them. Is anyone, is anyone lost? I mean, feel free to stop me. I'll be happy to help you out. Yeah. Can you go back to the slide that's the title overflow mitigation? Which one? Uh, forward, forward with the, uh, this? Yeah. So, where is the original process that we did the overflow? 
So EIP is not going to point anywhere here on the stack um, because during normal execution, that usually shouldn't happen. And the problem with von Neumann architecture is that it can't distinguish between data and instructions. So normally data is all, you know, normally, normally instructions are kept in the dot text segment of the process image. And that's set with permissions uh, executable and perhaps readable, but definitely not writable. So EIP is somewhere in that doc text segment, executing whatever the instructions are that are appropriate uh, for whatever this function stack is. So does that kind of answer your question? Um, just like this is so kind of like a generic model for any stack. It's a, a new stack is loaded. So if, if that function that's called has exception handling in it, I believe so, yes. Um, the main function, int main, will have that in it as well, uh, by default, I believe. Anyone else? So uh, handle, uh, the dispatcher runs into separate threads as, as having it all stacks. It can. It doesn't need to. Um, I don't believe it currently does, but Microsoft could change the next version um, to run as that. It wouldn't mitigate this uh, attack, though, because you're still pointing to some, um, some code in another module and giving it that stack. So you overwrite the stack, create an exception, you Essentially, yes. So, let's get back to. Essentially, to recap, yeah, you first handle any of the stack cookies, then you craft a <coughs> payload such that it was originally. On the stack, there was all that stack data. Then you have to find the beginning of the SEH records. And then you have to overwrite them as such, so such that basically you have whatever you're overflowing with right up to the SEH records here. And you have this short jump code that jumps back to the shell code for when you trick the exception handler to basically pop, pop, return back and point EIP here. And this is for basically exploiting the fact that safe SEH does not prevent you from executing uh, any exception handling code in uh, modules outside the current process image. Um, now I should note that since you have shellcode on the stack and you're pointing EIP back here to even execute this jump handler, this requires an executable stack. So if your stack is not executable, then this will not work. Um, in the latest operating systems that are fully patched, the stack is usually not executable. Um, I, the section after the next one uh, is all about executable security mechanisms um, and a brief history of them. So um, if the stack is not executable, um, I think this part is wrong uh, because this jump code won't work either. Um, so there's an important caveat. Um, since this is usually part of some <coughs> string buffer overflow, there can't be any null codes in here. And so we went over how to do that all in crafting shell code. However, if this pointer to that outside DLL has this like its address being slash x eight zero 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 five blah blah blah. That set of zeros will all be null bytes. So it'll actually cause the exploit to fail because it'll truncate right at that null byte when the string function copies it or moves it into that buffer. So it's still tricky to exploit this. Um, and if you guys are fuzzy on how this works, I have a video to a uh, YouTube demo of this that someone else has done. 
and it's quite good. So Linux does not support structured exception handling. However, uh, conceptually it can be implemented on top of the basically uh, the signals used by Linux. Um, and Wine actually, which is uh, basically a Windows emulator for Linux, Wine implements this. And the code uh, for Wine's implementation is here. And it's quite interesting. Um, it's not difficult to read. It's basically, it's basically catching signals as they come in the same way that try-catch uh, handles exceptions. Um, so uh, most Linux systems don't have a window saying that this process has encountered an error and needs to close. Would you like to send a report to the developers for bug reporting, or would you like to just close it? However, um, in recent versions of Ubuntu and perhaps other Debian systems, there is something that's introduced called app port, um, which is essentially SEH emulation on Linux. And it introduces these error messages. The application has closed unexpectedly. Would you like to leave it closed, relaunch, or show details, or perhaps send an error report to fix this problem? Um, so this is very interesting. It intercepts crashes right when they happen on Linux, um, or at least does a pretty good job of doing that. And for the error reporting, it gathers info about the crash in the OS environment and uh, app port runs as a service, so it has root permissions. It uses uh, basically this proxys kernel core pattern uh, binary to directly pipe core dumps uh, into the service. And I don't know, I thought maybe uh, this might be exploitable, but I'm not sure. Um, it depends on the permissions for proxys kernel core pattern. But if it's writable by other users. Perhaps uh, someone could build a fuzzer for app port and see if there's any vulnerabilities in the app port uh, service. Since it runs at root, it's a good target to perhaps spawn a shell. So this basically gets automatically invoked for unhandled exceptions. And uh, this is a URL for details, more details on that. So I briefly mentioned that if you point the exception dispatcher for the SEH handler to the heap, it will still execute. Which brings us to heap exploitation. Um, these are some good resources. Um, I got to go a little quicker. And essentially, uh, to, do, to exploit heaps, you have to understand the memory allocator. The goals of memory allocator design are basically to make it efficient and to make it minimize space and waste, uh, minimize uh, fragmentation. Um, there are two main algorithms. Basically, there are boundary tags. So for each chunk that you allocate, at the beginning of the chunk, you have metadata that uh, denotes the size, and it's the same thing at the end of the chunk. So at both ends of the chunk, beginning and end, you have uh, a size variable that knows how big that chunk is. Um, the other algorithm is binning, where basically uh, chunks are maintained in predetermined bins, spots in memory, and then they're grouped in si by size. Uh, basically, the memory allocator puts chunks where they best fit to minimize waste. So this is an example of the boundary algorithm example. Um, basically, you have all these chunks, and at the beginning and the end, you have uh, uh, their size. And this is an example of uh, the binning algorithm, where basically, um, this is, I think, logarithmically grouped, and you can read more about it there. It's not, it's not too important at this point. Um, so heaps initially start off empty, um, and there's two main structures that are first written on the heap. First is the heap management structure, and this contains all the information regarding the heap objects and for tracking the heap chunks. It keeps track of something that's important called the free list, this is a linked list that connects all the unallocated chunks, um, which contains, which is uh, managed by a free list bitmap, and then basically a beginning and end pointer to that linked list. Um, and then it allocates a structure called the free chunk, um, and that's basically here. And the free chunk is essentially 
um, groups all of the unallocated space at the end of the heap together into one giant free chunk. So after allocating two chunks, say we allocate chunk A and chunk B, in a very rudimentary heap allocator, it will look like this. Basically, you have the header and basically the chunk, and maybe if it's a boundary allocator, you have the size variable at the end of the chunk. And then after that, you have chunk B and chunk B's data, and then you have the last free chunk um, as following. So these pointers, um, uh, these chunk headers have pointers to the next chunk and to the previous chunk. And these pointers are, by, are used by free for uh, basically garbage collection when uh, freeing up allocated heap chunks. So say we were to free chunk B, uh, something called coalescing occurs. Essentially B gets freed up and you can see the last free chunk space uh, section has uh, merged to include it as well. This is called coalescing. Coalescing is essentially the act of merging uh, freed up chunks together into one single chunk. It's pretty straightforward. So it's important to note that this is just a toy example and not and heap chunks are not all allocated in a predictable manner this way. Um, over the years, a lot of design effort went into making uh, the allocator hard to predict for security reasons, uh, to perhaps make it, rather to specifically make it more difficult to point directly to the shell code that you allocate on the heap. <clears throat> so the standard C routines for interacting with the heap um, are generally malloc free and realloc. There's other ones like uh, break and mmap uh, but those can be uh, inefficient. So generally the above ones and variants of those are used. So this is a common heap overflow bug. Um, and I've just highlighted what the vulnerability is so for the sake of time. Um, essentially we malloc uh, something and we have basically a variable that at some point the user has control of. So this is vulnerable because if an attacker can allocate an array of zero and then basically um, at some point you copy into that allocated buffer, you're overriding whatever is on the heap afterwards towards higher memory. So another example um, is essentially um, say for two adjacent chunks, um, if you can overwrite from one into the other, you will overwrite that chunk header. So that chunk header contains those pointers to the next chunk and the previous chunk. And so if free is called, it will fail because it'll point to some random address that you've, because you've overflowed it, and it will segment call. Um, it will cause this six sev, uh, signal. Um, so, uh, however, an attacker can still recreate the chunk header and um, this in certain cases can be used to redirect execution. So, so it's important to note, um, in Windows there can be multiple heaps. Each process gets a default one. All threads for a process share a common heap. Um, some DLLs that are loaded create their own heap, um, and you can create separate heaps for different purposes. Uh, the book gives this example, um, though I wasn't able to find any exploits examples that use something like this, allocating something with specified permissions. I'm not sure if this is, is actually depreciated or not, but certainly if it's, if it's still a valid function, being able to allocate arbitrary uh, memory segments with whatever permissions you want allows you for to both write to them with shellcode and then execute that segment as well. 
Um, so there's a pretty good presentation at Black Hat, I believe in 2007, um, called, well, involving something called Heap Feng Shui. Um, and essentially, it describes tactics to manipulate the allocation of heap blocks in order to basically redirect the program control flow to the shellcode. So I uh, mentioned that here, um, basically, if you recreate the chunk headers, in some cases, you can uh, hijack control flow. So that's, that's an interesting read if you want to explore that. Um, and then this finally brings me to heap sprays. Um, heap sprays are a common attack used on uh, malicious web pages. Well, I shouldn't say it's a common attack because by itself, it's actually not a security problem. It happens to just be a feature that makes exploitation easier. Um, so on websites, JavaScript, VBScript, ActionScript, uh, certain images, and also recently discovered HTML5 allow you to uh, arbitrarily allocate things to the heap for that web browser. So a heap spray is basically the art of allocating a ton of chunks to the heap, and each chunk essentially contains a giant knot sled and at the end of that a shell code. And in the case that things have randomized address space layouts, if you jump to somewhere on the heap and you've managed to allocate a ton of malicious chunks on the heap, there's a pretty good chance, at the very least by brute forcing, that you'll get lucky, hit a knot sled, and eventually get to the malicious shellcode. So um, it's an interesting technique that I'm pretty sure I will show you <laughs> later on during our uh, web security lectures in a couple weeks. And so this brings me to um, executable security mechanisms. Some of this is recap of what we've covered so far. And so I'd like to start it off with perhaps a debate of who should protect what. We've seen so far basically the art of writing shell code, the art of stack overflows, and we've discussed like concepts of whether or not the stack should be executable or not, and whether or not the heap should be executable or not, and then the very problem of the von Neumann architecture of it can't distinguish between data and instructions on its own uh, in, at, at the very base uh, of its, I guess. That's, that's pretty much one of its main features, though. Um, and then other concepts. So, does anyone have any opinions? Say, say for protecting the stack, preventing it from being executable. Should the operating system handle that? Compiler, with the hardware perhaps? Any, any votes? Who votes OS? Okay, that's a good number of you. Who votes the hardware? Okay. Um, all right. And for, say, preventing stack overflows, heap overflows with things like canaries, um, should perhaps the hardware manage that? Perhaps by having data have, we've previously covered just <coughs> briefly in theory, the theory of uh, tagged architecture where data has basically credentials, those credentials contain metadata as to who the owner of that data, it's basically size, so maybe the processor could use that to determine, hey, something's overflown into this, this variable. Who says the, oh, the hardware should handle that? We have a vote. How about the, the operating system? All right. How about the linker and compiler? A couple votes. <coughs> All right, so let's get into it. Um, so let's start with Linux exploit mitigations. Um, let's start with something called the NX bit. Um, this means never execute. It's a bit flag that is offered as a feature um, by processors um, to flag data uh, to, distinguish, to distinguish it as either data or instructions. So that in the case of instructions, 
uh, in the case of this data, uh, that flag is set, and thus the processor knows to never execute it. Um, however, this requires basically handling that flag being set um, through some extra implementation in the operating system layer, or perhaps uh, some other layer. So essentially what this means in general is that it prevents execution of the stack. Um, so one of the beginning techniques we showed is return to libc, and that will still work. Um, so this is a pretty good reference uh, for advanced return to libc exploitation um, on beating uh, uh, Linux executable security mechanisms such as NX and uh, stack cookies and etc. So moving on to stack cookies, essentially GCC is a standard compiler for most Linux distributions um, and the community has developed extensions to protect the stack against overflows by essentially using canaries. First thing that came along was stack guard. It provided very weak canary protection. Um, it wasn't random enough and it only protected the return address. It was not adopted by the GCC team but it did inspire uh, something called Pro Police, which was re-implemented in GCC version 4.1 and is currently part uh, of the standard uh, distribution of OpenBSD, FreeBSD, Ubuntu, Debian systems, etc. Uh, it features better canary generation. Um, it protects function arguments, not just the return address. And sometimes it rearranges variables in order to deter overflowing them. Another feature that it offers is it backs up copies of function arguments so they can check against them later in case they've been overflowed. So if you overflow past the return address and into those function arguments, it can detect that. So another thing that I've hinted on here and there is something called address space layout randomization. There's a file that's either 0, 1, or 2 in Linux systems located at proc, sys, kernel, and named randomized VA space. Um, when it's 0, it's disabled, and when it's not 0, it's effectively enabled. Its primary feature for mitigating uh, stack attacks and, and basically <coughs> executable attacks is that it randomly arranges positions of key data areas upon process initialization. So right at runtime, when everything's being put together in memory, the positions of the base of the executable are randomized, the positions of the libraries are randomized, and the heap and the stack are also randomized as well. Essentially what that means is the beginning of the stack is some other random is, is some random position, the beginning of the heap is some random position, they still grow in the same ways, they still behave the same. Um, so usually the base of the executable begins at 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Um, so this gets randomized as well. So that throws, uh, if that weren't even the case, it would still be really difficult. But because that is the case, that throws a lot of other things off as well. So this mitigation outright breaks almost all shell code with hard-coded addressing techniques that are perhaps relying at um, my shell code that I put in the environment variables to be in the same place every time. So a good way, the easiest way to detect whether or not ASLR is enabled uh, on Linux is to have a little bit of code that prints out the address of something and run it twice. If it's the same, then ASLR is disabled. If they're different addresses, then ASLR is enabled. So for instance, I've shown you previously uh, 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 some C code called get environment address uh, that's provided by the book. And I use that to locate the shellcode that I put in env environment variables previously. So if you simply use that and locate environment variable two different times and it's a different space, different address each time and the environment variables themselves haven't changed, you haven't added more, taken some way, then ASLR is definitely enabled. Um, it can break many return to library based attacks, so return to libc because those libraries load in random locations. Um, yeah. So here are some notes on bypassing ASLR. Um, a weak version of ASLR has been in the Linux kernel since 2.6.12, basically 
2005. However, it's commonly claimed that there's not enough entropy and randomness in uh, that algorithm. And so this allows attackers to still brute force exploits. Um, they just run it tens of thousands of times and eventually they'll get lucky and hit that knob sled. Um, so, however, um, each failed attempt will usually cause a segmentation fault and that leaves logs. So that's why, say, if this is being exploited over the network, this would probably occur at 4 a.m. or so when no one's awake. So then they, once they actually do get in the system, they can go and clean up the logs while no one's looking at apps if it's not set up right. So there are actually a number of kernel patches offered by the community to harden uh, the implementation of ASLR. Um, but it's still brute forceable. All you're doing is randomizing things. And uh, it just makes, no matter, how, no matter how well you implement the algorithm, all you're doing is taking, uh, raising the bar for the attacker. He has to try this number of more times to get lucky. Basically, it's the art of guessing a random number that someone has chosen. Eventually, you're going to get lucky. It's just X number of tries. So <clears throat> attackers have an advantage when it's uh, when the overflow that they can exploit is not part of some command line argument. Um, for a process to start, handle that command line, and then exit. Say it's something like a running service, like a network application. Um, that address space is only randomized right when it's run. So an attacker can keep trying over and over and over, and it'll be the same layout every time until it crashes. So in that case, statistically, it takes less time, less amount of tries for an attacker to get lucky. However, in the case that it's randomized every time, it's many more tries. Um, also, uh, it's important to lock down the permissions of uh, proc files because all the randomization details for the map, memory map of a process can be accessed in those proc files. So this brings us to uh, patches that harden this algorithm. Um, one of the first more popular ones is known as PAX. Um, it offered better ASLR. It implements uh, the NX bit by default. Um, for Linux systems that perhaps were installed on legacy machines and uh, that wasn't implemented in that version. Um, and there's some small efforts also to mitigate return to libc exploits. Um, but uh, this is a good article on defeating uh, PAX features, um, such as their address space uh, randomization. It's a little bit old, but it's a good read. Um, and this brings me to GR security, which uh, is a patch offered, um, if you see the URL at the top, it's pax.grsecurity.net. So the PAX team and the GR security team teamed up, and uh, the GR security patch is actually includes PAX, um, and it's optimized for web servers, and offers a lot of uh, more proactive security. It hardens against a LD preload attacks, has much better ASLR, and a lot of other features. So. Uh, I mentioned LD preload, I think, last Tuesday as a way to load, um, to redirect the loading of shared libraries for a dynamic linker to point to whatever you'd like to get, uh, the target process to load. And so that wraps that up and brings us to Windows exploit mitigations. Um, so Windows implemented something called DEP. It's their take on NX. DEP just stands for Data Execution Prevention. Um, essentially, if it's writable, it's not executable. That's the principle that it's trying to implement, just like NX. Um, so, it, by default, uh, makes the stack and the heap not executable, and so you can't have any more shell code there. Um, but you can still have control data there, so you can still do return to library attacks, like return to libc. Uh, if you can overwrite like the return address, yeah. Okay, you uh, If you're requiring JMP to be placed by you on the stack and for it to be executed, then no, because the stack's not executable. Yeah. Yeah, so you can override that those control 
uh, variables on the stack, like the return value on the stack, so you can have it return to some other address, like to system or libc. And then ASLR in Windows is enabled in, uh, by default in Windows Vista and beyond. So that's back in 2007. However, uh, it's only enabled for executables and DLLs that are specifically linked to be ASLR enabled. Um, you can force ASLR for all executables and libraries with this uh, registry flag um, by setting it to either one or zero. And so the following things are randomized by Windows implementation of ASLR. The location of the heap, location of the stack, location of the process environment block, which is basically the data block of the main thread, and the thread environment block. Yes? But in Windows, you can have multiple Yes. So if you load a DLL that's not linked to be ASLR enabled, the location of that heap may not be randomized. I believe it actually will not be randomized. So that's interesting to know. So uh, I guess something that's worth noting, um, on 32-bit Windows systems prior to Windows 8, if you can basically pull off a big heap spray and in effect reduce the available memory on the system to kind of critical levels, it can reduce the effectiveness, basically the randomness of the ASLR algorithm perhaps making it easier to get lucky. And so this is for reference. The, 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 the process environment block is listed in uh, this diagram here. I think the, the thread environment block is somewhere nearby uh, towards the top of the, the memory space. And this brings us to stack cookies in Windows, uh, which are labeled, which are titled the slash GS flag, or rather the GS switch. It's essentially a Microsoft Visual C or C++ compiler option that adds code to uh, the assembly uh, prologue and epilogues uh, statements for functions um, to prevent, you know, stack-based attacks, you know, preventing overriding the return address preventing override the SEH uh, structure, um, as we've already demonstrated. Um, so I think I previously mentioned this paper on uh, defeating in, in the SEH <laughs> section. Um, it's, it's, it's a good read. I want to doubly reiterate it. And so these were enabled by default in 2003 um, and can be disabled uh, with the GS minus flag um, when you recompile something. Um, and the rest is pretty straightforward. Um, it also protects against vulnerable parameters for a function, which are specifically any pointers, C++ reference, C structures that perhaps contain pointers or string buffers that are point, uh, passed along to a function. Um, here are some other bypass notes uh, that are worth noting. Um, GS offers no protection when uh, function parameters do not include buffers. Um, it still will protect against the return address from being uh, overwritten. Or if the slash O optimization flag is not enabled, which is interesting. Um, and the rest are relatively self-explanatory. You guys can read them. I'm running out of time, though. So we talked about safe SEH. Um, and then this brings me to SEHOP, which was introduced in 2008 as a way to mitigate um, the pop-pop return exploits to attack uh, SEH. So essentially, what structured exception handler overwrite protection SEHOP does is that when the exception dispatcher function uh, kicks in, the first thing it does is it makes sure that this linked list is intact and it iterates all the way. It doesn't keep track of how long it is, but it makes sure it iterates to the default uh, pointer, which is basically the Windows default error message. This program has countered an error and needs to close a window. 
which is usually located when it's not randomized to FFFFFF, uh, -F 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 -F, et cetera. Um, so essentially, that function of this, the symbol name for it is NTDLL final exception handler. So it iterates through the whole linked list of uh, SEH records and is expecting the end one to be this. If it doesn't, it essentially uh, it closes and uh, basically executes this itself um, because it detects that something's wrong. So if we have basically our jump code here that is just jump six by four, then knob, knob, um, this will point somewhere probably uh, not the uh, Mm, actually, yes, because because this is an instruction, um, it will not point basically six points forward. However, if it's executed, it will jump six bytes forward. <laughs> but if it's interpreted as an address, it will point somewhere probably off the stack. Um, so that prevents the overriding of these next SEH records with basically a little jump to whatever your shellcode is. Also worth noting is that having your shellcode right afterwards will overwrite these structures, and so it will simply fail as well if you were even to get around that original thing. So the top link is actually a paper on how to bypass uh, SEHOP. And essentially, what you can do is you can still use uh, a certain jump assembly instruction um, you can use the JE jump, which starts with uh, X74. Usually the stack, when it's not randomized, starts with X80 or something between X7 something. So if this assembly instruction starts with X74, it's quite possible that as a pointer, um, it could point to a valid stack address. Um, and so if you have it point to perhaps uh, some address and then the next pointer at that, and, and that address happens to have a pointer to FFFFFFF or wherever the default handler is. It doesn't care how long that exception, uh, re the exception record chain is, as long as it correctly parses to the end, and the end should be the default handler for Windows. So if you have this jump instruction, JE, and jump perhaps six bytes forward and have a knob sled um, uh, wherever it's pointing, and then that leads to your shell code. Um, you can have uh, effectively a working exploit against this mitigation. So, however, when using the JE uh, call, you have to craft something that's called the Z flag, and this is part of the assembly document for this function, or for this instruction, opcode rather. Um, and so that's something that's stored in EAX. So in order to set it properly, uh, usually all that's needed is to set it to zero. And so in order to get this to work, when the exception handler kicks in, the exception dispatcher kicks in, it has that stack created, and you want to point to still some uh, address in a different module so that safe SEH won't prevent it from working. So you can bypass that. And originally what we want to do is point to a pop, pop return. If we can find a sequence that sets EAX to something, uh, we can set the Z flag. And actually, according to this paper, um, the sequence ZOR EAX pop, pop return is actually quite common. Now, a number of things can be after, can be between that first pop and the Zor EAX EAX. As long as you find somewhere in uh, the outside DLL to set EAX to zero before you pop, pop, return, the exploit will still work. And thus you'll be able to craft the Z flag and then jump to wherever the shellcode is. It's still quite difficult because you're working with, you know, the address that you jump to in that DLL can't have any null, by, null uh, bytes in it because you're still overflowing it you know, with the standard string uh, buffer overflow. And uh, even 
when ASR is enabled, you have to handle that uh, that last pointer to the Windows default uh, exception handler. Um, and that is going to actually be randomized with ASLR. However, according to their experimentation, it only takes 512 tries, roughly. So even though these things get randomized, some of these initial things, like the exception handlers, aren't that uh, random. Do you have a question? <coughs> What happens to the S S S H uh, pop-up if, if one of your um, pointers points to a previous record? Of the and it just basically yeah. iterates down and points all the way back up and it's just yeah. infinite. Will it do it? It probably will just hang unless there's some special detection of that. So that, that will eventually just cause um, an infinite loop. If it's not handled, especially by Microsoft, that's a good question. No questions. All right. Oh no, we're running out of time. So then there's heat protections that have been put in place to make things uh, harder to predict the uh, the allocation of chunks. Um, and there's also things like safe unlinking, so that um, when things are freed, it basically iterates through the free list and makes sure that there's nothing invalid going on. Um, and then there's also heat cookies that are checked upon free calls. Uh, so these are advanced exploitation tutorials offered by Corland.be. Um, they are wonderful for learning Windows exploitation. Um, so this is a slide to basically uh, recap everything. So the operating system and hardware actually work together to implement um, basically the NX bit. That is just simply DEP in Windows. Um, but there's also software-only versions of DEP for hardware that doesn't support it. And also code signing checks occur basically between the operating system and hardware. The operating system handles ASLR. Meanwhile, the linker and compiler handles uh, stack cookies, safe SEH, and SEHOP. Um, and so I still have a little bit more to do after this. Um, so even though we're fixing all of these problems, the ninjas are still there. And does anyone have any questions? Hopefully no, so I can jump through this next part. OK, uh, I want to get to two extra topics that are going to be relevant to the homework. Um, just the first one, really. If I don't get to the last one, that's fine. I'll cover it later. So there's something that's used by both good guys and bad guys. It's simply called binary patching. And it can be done with any hex editing tool. Um, in Linux, it's just quite simply hex edit that I prefer. Um, so essentially, what you can do is you can zero out or knock out any undesired instructions Perhaps you're trying to uh, analyze some malware that has all this nasty anti-reverse engineering code in it. Um, and so I'm actually going to make you do this in the homework. So pay attention. Um, so uh, essentially, let's say I have this malicious code. Um, if I analyze it with object dump to look at basically the whole source of it, um, I can see the contents of all the sections. So there's a dot comments section, and et cetera. Um, and I'm going to pipe this to a file so we can start from the beginning. Um, we, have the we have the dynamic <coughs> symbols. Those are the symbols to uh, address any dynamically linked libraries. Um, other things are GNU versions, sometimes populated. Um, and then the dot text is where all the instructions are. And so we're not looking at any assembly right here because we haven't done essentially the decoding of it. So if we wanted to say knock out something, what we do with the hex editor is effectively find the address, say, whoops. We want to find 8048B4. Whoops. <laughs> 
this case. So, uh, well, that I must be forgetting something. I didn't get any sleep last night. All right, there's another way you can uh, look for something. Is that essentially if you're trying to perhaps zor out some check against something specific, you can search for the actual values uh, in the hex. So, for instance, e nine eight one o two o o o. Am I looking at the right file? Oh well. I'm just going to show you guys uh, the quick example I prepared instead of improvising this. So, for instance, when looking at the source here, um, if I were a bad guy and I wanted to zero out, for instance, the comment section, um, which contains details on how this was compiled, I could hex edit this out by essentially looking for uh, this first uh, section of its data, and this should match there, and that should be relatively unique. And so I find it here, and you can see on the right that GCC, Ubuntu, etc. So essentially what a hex editor allows you to do is I can null out these bytes. Can I see that? Yeah. You can see them highlighted as white as I am nulling them out. And so effectively I want to go right until the last part here, which is the dot, right before the next section, which starts with 3.2. So there I'm done. And it kind of works like Emacs with this one, so I uh, hit Control X and it prompts me whether or not I want to save. So I hit yes. And then if I wanted to do uh, and look at uh, the comment section, it's all been zeroed out. So um, the reason I showed you this is because in the homework that I'm going to release today, homework four, um, it's going to have a problem in it that has been edited by it. So recently there was an O-Day release that causes GDB and IDA Pro to crash when you try to load a binary crafted with this O-Day to debug. GDB will seg fault right away and IDA Pro will crash right away as well. Um, what I'm going to give you guys is a small problem, a uh, small program that has this technique applied to it. So GDB will crash, NIDA Pro will crash. I will link you guys the URL to the blog post of the author for this technique. And you can go and look at exactly what this technique is doing. And the first part of the problem will be you'll have to use a hex editor to essentially zero out the section of the binary that is causing GDB to crash, or to IDA Pro to crash. Um, this was uh, used in, I think, NullSec CTF this weekend. Uh, and that was in reverse engineering 500 problem. I spent the whole weekend working on it. It was interesting. Um, so the blog post actually doesn't go into the details of how to uh, defeat uh, it. But there are certain segments that it adds or changes uh, in a binary that will be pretty easy for you guys to find because all of that uh, output is there on that blog. So what you'll have to do is you'll have to, with the hex editor, some trial and error, find which one's causing GDB to crash, then zero out. Then once you're able to load it in the debugger, the task, uh, the second task is uh, to find basically the, vernable, the vernability in it and exploit the vernability in it to get the key that's somewhere in there. The key will be pretty easy to find. However, getting it to print out uh, with the exploit will take a little bit of crafting. Um, it's not going to be too difficult, but it exposes you guys to some good stuff. And I also get to use the O-Day on you guys, which is a lot of fun. Um, so 
We'll probably revisit this same O day later um, in the networking homework. I'll probably have uh, a similar scenario where you are an incident responder um, and this botnet is attacking all your systems and it's using all these O days um, and it's also using this O day that prevents it from de being debugged. Um, luckily, you found out it's crafted with this. You found the blog. You guys already know how to disable it. So the first part will be to disable it. Then you basically have to do something similar uh, to find uh, something special in that bot. Uh, this data section will contain some key signal that if it receives it from, say, the command and control uh, server or from another bot, it will essentially initiate a self-destruct. So what you have to do for this later homework is You'll have to defeat this basically, this anti-reversing O-Day. Then you'll have to uh, find the vulnerability in the malware and exploit the vulnerability in the malware to get the self-destruct key. Then you're going to have to find out how to send a packet to the malware with that key in it to get it to shut down. And so that will be basically the whole homework. So that's going to be a really good problem because that's all real-world stuff. So um, the last thing I wanted to show you is uh, polymorphic shell code, which it essentially means um, encoding, but uh, I'll just bring that up when we do web application hacking because it's the most relevant there. So, does anyone have any questions? And before you go, um, for those of you who came in late, um, there's a problem with homework two, specifically uh, question four. I should have worded it better. It came to my attention last night that I did a very poor job of that. So, I'm going to have the homework due now. I'm going to reword problem four. I'm not going to create problem four on your turn in right now. I'm going to reword problem four and email it all to you guys and have it due next time. Essentially, what I'm getting at with the click jacking question is that it can occur in two cases. It can occur on malicious code on a website in which basically there's some malicious ad or something that's hijacked. You click somewhere and it clicks the above layer instead that perhaps is invisible. Or it can occur in adware and spyware, basically malware. Um, and so the <coughs> second part, part B, what I was getting at is how can clickjacking be implemented? And please reference uh, techniques we covered in our root kit lecture. I, was, I should have referred to, in the case of adware and spyware, how is it implemented? Because if you come at it from the perspective of it only works in uh, malicious websites, uh, Probably, I am not going to give you many points on your answer. So I want to be fair to you guys, and I'm going to release the revised version so that it'll be better. Any questions on that? Okay. Cool. And I'll send out an email later today when homework uh, 4 is released. So, uh, is there any value to do the quality there?